Hello, my name is Megan. I'm a programming librarian here at the Saskatoon Public Library. We are located on Treaty 6 territory, as well as the traditional homeland of the Métis. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sustainability Speaker Series. Presented in partnership with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, this video was recorded on a previous date. Please enjoy. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Sustainability Speaker Series presentation for September. So before I start introducing our speaker, I want to say a few words about Saskatchewan Environmental Society. So the Saskatchewan Environmental Society is operating since the 1970s on important issues such as sustainable energy, climate change solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you aren't already a member, I encourage you to join our society. You can always find out more about our diverse projects, activities and how to get involved um, by checking out our website at uh, www environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive uh, email notifications uh, uh, about uh, events in our uh, sustainability speaker series, you can send an email to the SES and the email address is uh, info at environmentalsociety.ca. In your email message, ask to be put uh, on the list of people to be notified of events in sustainability speaker series. All right, so our speaker this evening is uh, Bob Halliday. Bob is a consulting engineer and president uh, of R Halliday and Associates company. He has worked uh, at the Environment Canada and was director of Canada's National Hydrology Research Center. Uh, his company projects uh, have dealt with transboundary waters, floodplain management, and the effects of climate change on water resources. He has served on several international joint commission boards and other entities concerned with water issues of Canada and the United States. Bob is a board chair of the Partners for the Saskatchewan River Basin and vice president of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. In addition to water and energy issues, Bob is interested in science history and ancient civilizations. Bob Halliday is also a lead author of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society publication called Carbon Free Electricity in Saskatchewan that was released in April of this year. And this report examines and uh, updates the analysis and the recommendations from the earlier SES report that was released in 2013 with the title, Yes, They Can, a 2020 vision for SASC power. So uh, let's uh, welcome our uh, speaker, Bob Halliday. And uh, I guess I g give it to him to continue. Okay. Thank, thank you, Katja. And uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, as, uh, we will talk the next oh, 30 to 40 minutes, perhaps, uh, about uh, electricity in Saskatchewan and its current status and so on. I should point out uh, as I go through this that uh, the early part of this presentation uh, reflects very much the uh, recommendations SES made to SAS Power earlier this year. I've added a little bit more stuff uh, that's occurred since then. I'll try to make a distinction between what I think of as SES recommendations and just my own thoughts, but uh, you, you will get a little bit additional information in the course of of this uh, talk. Um, so let's move on to the, uh, the talk itself. And what I want to do is 
it was a, a little bit of an introduction about uh, why the whole question of um, uh, SAS power moving forward to a zero carbon future is important. And I wanted to be very clear on where SAS power is today and uh, what I see as its future plans. And then I would like to discuss the SES proposal from earlier this year. And then I'll take a little diversion into some, uh, what I think of as key concepts for power planning, because uh, some of them are, uh, uh, you know, not evident. And uh, at least one of them are two different definitions for the same same words. So, and then I'll finally close off with talking about the challenges and the way through them in the next uh, several years. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen signs like this, but uh, it's really, uh, it's a wave of the future. And uh, anytime we try to talk about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the, the answer always is electrify everything. And, uh, and that includes things like uh, transportation, um, heating and cooling and all those issues. And of course, to make that effective, it, you have to have uh, renewable power to provide the electricity. Because if you're just burning hydrocarbons to electrify other things so you can get off hydrocarbons, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so this is the challenge that SAS Power is facing and uh, as to how to move forward, whoops. And uh, just before we get into SAS power itself, I'd like to uh, show you where Saskatchewan is at in terms of greenhouse gas production. And you can see uh, uh, immediately that there are three or four really big ticket items and uh, including fossil fuel industries, transportation, agriculture, and electrical utilities. And the, uh, just uh, in, it would probably be another talk, but um, uh, SAS power, is, uh, not sorry, SAS power, the Saskatchewan government is making uh, some progress on reducing methane emissions from fossil fuel industries. And that's in concert with a federal program. Um, going around this pie chart, uh, uh, the government is doing nothing on the transportation front. And in fact, uh, next month will impose a tax on electric vehicles, which uh, is definitely counterintuitive. The province is also doing nothing on the agricultural front. And um, they are doing some work in related to heavy industry and manufacturing, again, in concert with the federal government. And the province has passed the, um, or enacted the national energy code for buildings. So it helps the building situation a little bit. But one of the big ticket items is SAS power and uh, their plans for the future, and certainly transitioning SAS power out of um, uh, hydrocarbon power is the way to go. So let's turn to SAS power now and take a look at uh, where they're at. And uh, the important thing to note is that um, SAS power is now a natural gas utility, not a coal utility. They, uh, in effect, uh, some, coal-fired plants have been shut down. One has been converted to CCS, at least one unit. And uh, in doing so, they, they've ex vastly expanded the natural gas part of the utility. I, I flag as well in the front center, the, uh, there is a, they are importing power from Manitoba Hydro, and we'll talk more about that later. The other thing, if you're quickly adding up the, uh, the pies, uh, you'll see that at the moment, uh, about a quarter of SAS power's capacity is based on uh, renewable power. And so there, you know, when you compare that to uh, the big hydro companies uh, like BC Hydro, Quebec Hydro, and Manitoba Hydro, um, you, you can see that SAS power has a, a fair way to go to get to renewable power mixes. I should also add in fairness to SAS power that that 5% wind that SAS power now has in its capacity will probably double by the end of this year. They're bringing a couple of wind farms on stream fairly quickly. And uh, so there, there will be a change in the, in, within a year and showing a increased uh, wind generation. If you um, try to then cast your mind forward to 2030, um, 
SAS Power has made commitments to uh, uh, shut down the uh, boundary dam power station units that are not fitted with carbon capture and storage. And the dates that have been given are 2021, so like one unit this year, another unit in 2024, and a further the last unit in 2027. Uh, the corporation has also made a firm decision not to convert anything at Boundary Dam to uh, carbon capture and storage. The, uh, the timing of the Poplar River and Shan power stations, Poplar River is near Cornac and straight south in the province, and uh, Shan is near Esteban. Uh, most of the SAS power literature implies that they'll be shut down by 2029. Um, in accordance with federal guidelines. But uh, I haven't actually seen a date for that, but uh, in effect, the corporation by 2030 will be off coal. They've also made um, a commitment to having 50% renewable capacity by 2030. And that's largely due to expanding wind uh, generated power. And they've also made a commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 2005 by 2030. And of course, that's the effect of uh, converting, uh, or not converting, but uh, getting the corporation off coal. Also in some of SAS powers of material, uh, it's not totally evident, but you will see at least a um, aspirational target of uh, being a net zero or carbon free by 2050. And uh, so that's where the corporation stands at this moment. When we turn to this SES report um, that was released earlier this year, we, um, we felt that uh, SAS power should be actually net zero by 2040. And there's um, a number of reasons for that, and I'll discuss them in a few minutes. And also uh, we felt that there's a need for an interim target to help along in that general to that goal and uh, they would, and that target should be to have 50% renewable uh, generation by 2030. There's quite a gap between SAS powers install capacity and the um, sources of the power it actually generates. And so a lot of the power that SAS power generates is still from coal and gas or gas and coal, I should say, because gas dominates, but uh, they tend to use the hydro capacity they have as a peaking power during a high demand. And they tend to, of course, when the wind blows, they, they do use the wind power, but they can't count on that all the time. So, so anyway, let's um, turn to the question of accelerating the transition to renewables. And uh, the first thing I wanted to comment on was the, the fact that electricity and transportation are intrinsically tied together because you know, um, if you uh, convert transportation to electric vehicles, it's uh, not very satisfying to charge that vehicle from non-renewable power. And uh, they, they tend to go hand in hand. Uh, there's also another uh, interesting concept in that uh, when you convert transportation to electrical vehicles, you actually reduce the demand for uh, gasoline and diesel fuel. And most of the oil and gas that's uh, produced in, sorry, most of the oil and, uh, and that's produced in Saskatchewan to make diesel fuel and gasoline um, is, uh, is uh, used in transportation. And of course, um, as transportation cuts back, the oil production cuts back and uh, the largest single um, industrial use of uh, electricity in the province is uh, in uh, the oil and gas industry. So in effect, by uh, tying the electricity generation to transportation, you, you can uh, deal with the increased demand for electricity while the uh, oil demand is cutting back. The other reason for um, trying to move this advance even more is that um, the province and the country needs to allow more time for what I call the the difficult tasks, uh, uh, the um, electricity generation, transportation, and building related energy consumption are really the easy parts of uh, the transition to a low carbon economy. 
And uh, we need to have, uh, I think, uh, get those out of the way and on the way at least before uh, uh, we take on some of the difficult tasks that are, are ahead of us. And uh, things like uh, uh, power used in cement plants and uh, various and other industrial purposes. The other thing that uh, makes the 2050 aspirational target of uh, SAS power a little difficult is that there are a lot of pressures in, and this is only in the last six months since uh, SES released its report. The, there are a lot of pressures now for um, to get electricity off hydrocarbons by 2035. And the International Energy Agency has just uh, released a report where they speak of uh, getting net zero emissions and electricity by all the advanced economies um, in by 2035. And basically that's the, um, the G20 countries to the most extent. Uh, President Biden in the United States has made a commitment to being net zero electricity by 2035. The, University, the European Union is, has a decarbonizing energy supply policy that is aimed at 2035 as well. And then in the last few months or last few weeks, I should say, uh, one of the Liberal Party's campaign pledges was to be off carbon based electricity by 2035. So there are a lot of pressures um, pushing to um, certainly uh, it makes the, the 2040 goal that SES uh, uh, put forward a few months ago, it makes that goal look a, a little bit um, insufficient. And it certainly makes the SAS power goal of 2050 uh, look very, very in, in, insufficient. So uh, the question then is what, what, what do we do? And before we do talk about that, I'd like to uh, mention a couple of uh, key concepts. When you uh, read the literature on uh, power engineering and electricity generation, um, there's a few words that show up all the time. And uh, one of them is dispatchable power. And uh, there, there are actually two definitions for dispatchable power in circulation. and. Uh, I had a chat with Mark Jacquard, who has written widely on um, climate change issues. He's a prof at University of, uh, or Simon Fraser University, but he pointed out that in the uh, SES publications, I, I used the uh, dispatchable power in the sort of a least preferred way. And uh, in the, the, the best way to use dispatchable power is to think of it as power that's available when you need it. So uh, in, the, in terms of uh, at least it's available and uh, you can turn it on and off. And, uh, and so we, the, the, the um, coal-fired power plants that run more or less continuously will always be able to provide power provided they're running and uh, gas-fired power plants are the same. But of course, uh, wind generation and solar generation are not dispatchable. They, you might want power, but if the sun's not shining or the wind isn't blowing, you're not going to get that uh, that power when you want it. Uh, the other definition of dispatchable power is actually best uh, defined in, in what we call the ramping rate. And uh, even Wikipedia defines uh, dispatchable power in, in a ramping rate sense. And what that definition means is that um, you, you can turn on or you can da demand power and you can achieve that power very, very quickly. And so a, a gas fired power plant can ramp up to speed uh, in literally in minutes. Uh, hydroelectricity generation can ramp up very quickly. And of course, if you don't need the power, you can turn it back down again. But uh, things like, um, uh, you know, the coal fired power plants do not ramp up quickly. And so this ramping rate is important when uh, you start getting a mix of uh, renewable and non-renewable power in your system. The other thing that I wanted to mention is the idea of uh, electrical storage. And uh, you'll see uh, a lot of accounts lately of battery storage and uh, the Kawasis uh, First Nation has a, a wind turbine with some battery storage. Uh, SAS Power is building a battery storage facility in Regina. 
And a related one is, um, is compressed air. And uh, battery storage is pretty self-evident. You charge the battery and then you draw it down when you need power. In terms of compressed air, what you do is uh, pump air into a, a salt cavern. And uh, Saskatchewan is blessed with uh, ample resources to uh, have salt caverns, underground caverns that can be filled with compressed air. And in fact, that's how the province stores natural gas is in uh, underground caverns. But uh, air can be compressed in these caverns and then uh, drawn off and used to generate electricity. And of course, you're, with the battery storage and the compressed air, you're uh, using available power, so for example, when the wind is blowing to charge the batteries and compress the air and making it available when you don't have, uh, or you have a demand for electricity and uh, the wind isn't blowing. In terms of reservoirs, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, they operate like a just like a gigantic battery. And uh, Lake Diefenbaker in Saskatchewan holds more water than all the reservoirs in Alberta put together. And uh, but at the same time, if you ran the generators at uh, Lake Diefenbaker, Cotto Creek, continuously, you'd empty Lake Diefenbaker in about three or four months. So it actually, that reservoir can serve as a enormous battery where uh, if the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, you release less water from Lake Diefenbaker. And then when you, uh, when you have the need for more power, the water is available to generate that power. I should point out before we leave the question of storage though, but batteries and compressed air are really at only at the stage now where they can be used for so-called intraday smoothing. So, you know, in, the, in a 24 hour period or some relatively short period of time, the uh, batteries and compressed air storage allow you to kind of smooth out the, uh, the power curve so that, uh, you know, if you don't lose uh, you, that when the cloud, when the sun goes behind a cloud, you don't suddenly have a crisis with uh, uh, power demand. So, but it's really that short-term storage. On the other hand, uh, the large reservoirs uh, like Lake Diefenbaker uh, can store, um, you know, we, you know, much, much more power or, or, or water, and therefore you can uh, have seasonal storage for generating at uh, various times of the year. The other sort of technical concept that you'll hear a lot about is demand side management, and in effect, the um, the demand side management is a question that. Uh, um, the cheapest power you can produce is the power you save. And uh, I think that's a, a concept that SAS Power has used to some extent. Uh, SES feels that they should be doing more demand size management work. But it's also in, a, in, a, in the SAS Power network, um, some parts of the province are, um, you know, power supply is tighter than other parts of the province. And so it makes a lot of good sense for them to uh, especially use demand side management where uh, power supplies are tighter and uh, not worry about it quite so much where there's uh, more power available. But uh, it is a term you'll see a lot. And it's, uh, it's basically uh, looking at energy conservation, energy efficiency as a way of uh, improving uh, or, or reducing demand. And again, you can uh, use demand side management to smooth out the power demand in the course of the day. Let's uh, step on now to uh, meeting the challenge of, uh, of, of these uh, things that we, uh, that SAS Power has to face. And uh, the first one relates to their natural gas power generation. And uh, at the moment, the utility has uh, about 1300 megawatts of natural gas generating capacity. They have uh, 360 megawatts under construction at Moose Jaw and another 360 megawatts proposed for either uh, down the Estevan area or in the Saskatoon area. And, uh, and the, the key point of all of this is that only about 250 megawatts of that uh, natural gas capacity will reach the end of its natural life by 2040. And uh, this reliance on natural gas, uh, you know, for meeting uh, post 2030 targets, makes it a real challenge for the corporation too, because 
natural gas is still a, a hydrocarbon and depending on where that gas is sourced from, uh, you know, some commentators say that uh, fracked natural gas could be almost as carbon intensive as coal. And, uh, and so, I, you know, for the most part, I believe uh, SAS Power gets its gas from Alberta and those are traditional gas fields rather than frack gas fields. But uh, there's a real challenge with, uh, with that uh, question of, uh, you know, replacing all the coal with uh, natural gas forward power plants. As I kind of alluded to with the um, natural gas is a, is a dispatchable source. So you can turn it on and off and make it available. And also it can ramp it up and ramp it down very, very quickly. So it's a, you can see why SAS power went to natural gas. It's a, it's a versatile fuel and, and it's relatively low cost power. The challenge is that um, it, 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 because of the newness of the natural gas generating stations in the province, SAS power faces what I call, what others call the, the stranded asset problem. If indeed the federal government says that um, SAS power should be free of all carbon generation by 2035 rather than 2050, in effect, the corporation has to shut down uh, a lot of assets before their um, end of their natural life. And, uh, or fit it with carbon capture and storage, perhaps. Uh, the other option would be to uh, buy offsets. And so it, it would become a high cost power and uh, very, very quickly. And the other thing with uh, carbon capture and storage for existing gas power stations is there is still a host of uh, technology and cost issues related to that. There are prototype CCS uh, gas plants around the world, but nothing that you'd call operational. And one way forward, if you're still going to use natural gas as a fuel, is to consider um, so-called cogeneration. A lot of large industrial facilities uh, use heat as part of the process. You can imagine uh, uh, potash mines, uh, yeah, the, um, the steel plant in Regina, the um, uh, the proposed uh, restarting of a paper mill at Prince Albert. All of these uh, facilities have options where a large amount of heat is generated and it's relatively straightforward to use that excess heat to uh, generate electricity. And actually uh, SAS Power has done that at two uh, potash mines in the province. So uh, one way forward might be to uh, forget about uh, new uh, natural gas power stations and investigate uh, cogeneration. And, uh, yeah, you know, that still leaves a challenge of existing stations, but it might reduce the demand for a uh, the, the problem down the road. Next one I wanted to talk about um, was the uh, connection to Manitoba Hydro. And this is a, a proposal that um, SES first made, uh, oh, probably almost 10 years ago. And uh, Saskatchewan, SAS Power is in the process of, uh, of connecting to Manitoba Hydro on a, on a um, full-time basis. And they do have a, a 125 megawatts of capacity from uh, Manitoba Hydro, and they're going to move to uh, 240 megawatts in 2022-23. And what SES proposed was that uh, uh, they could go to about a thousand megawatts, and uh, and then um, you know shut down the uh, coal-fired power plants much more quickly. But uh, but that connection to Manitoba Hydro has a, a lot of advantages. And uh, first of all, it's uh, it's dispatchable power, so it's available when uh, SAS power would want it. It also has that high ramping speed, so you can import it or let it go as you or turn it back down as you see fit. And that the um, connecting two relatively small utilities like SAS Power and uh, Manitoba Hydro um, actually strengthens both utilities. It, it leads to reliability um, just as SAS Power can use Lake Diefenbaker to store water. If Lake Diefenbaker is full and water moves downstream, it could be stored by Manitoba Hydro and Lake Winnipeg. And uh, there's something that power engineers call conservation of VARs, which is also a, 
a benefit of, of strong connections between power utilities. And so there are a lot of good reasons to uh, connect the two power state, two power companies. Uh, I've often heard it said that that would mean that um, SAS power would become a, an importer of power rather than a generator of power. But in effect, when they generate power from uh, natural gas, they're importing that natural gas from Alberta. So if it, you, you can import natural gas from Alberta or you can import power from Manitoba, it really uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, sort of conceptual difference in the two. The other thing with this uh, Manitoba hydro connection is the uh, there's really no technological or economic barriers to doing it. It's just, uh, I think it needs political will and uh, uh, a willingness to, um, to move ahead on that front rather than other fronts. In terms of uh, solar power, uh, SAS Power is really a laggard in uh, solar power developments. They, um, at the moment, they, I, I think I'm right in this number, but there are only about you know, 30 megawatts of uh, customer generated power in the whole SAS Power system. And uh, at the moment, the uh, corporation is making a few um, 10 megawatt additions to their capacity. And when you consider that currently in Alberta, there's a 400 megawatt power, solar power facility under construction right now. And uh, I should say, when I say solar power, I'm thinking of photovoltaic power, the, you know, the solar panels you see on roofs and, and so on. And uh, this one is, uh, is, is one of the things that um, uh, SES thought that uh, SAS power really need to get, um, uh, get its act together and get uh, utility scale solar power in place. There's kind of another little quirk in solar power is that the utility is getting increasingly closer to having its peak demand in the summer rather than the winter. And of course, uh, solar starts to look a little bit more appealing if you think of having uh, peak demand in July rather than in, in December. So uh, there, there are reasons to uh, get serious about solar power. In terms of its uh, capability, it's, it's non-dispatchable power. It's, uh, if the sun's not shining, you're not going to get any solar power. But it, 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 to some extent, it's uh, complementary with hydro because uh, of the use of Lake Diefenbaker. And it's even complementary with wind because uh, there are occasions when the, the wind is blowing and the sun's shining, and that's fine. But there are other times when you have wind power or solar power, but not both. So there are some complementarities in that sense as well. And uh, you know, this province south of the Trans-Canada Highway especially has the, by far the best solar potential in Canada. And, uh, but really at the moment, SAS Power lacks experience and they need to uh, ramp up that experience quickly to meet the demands of that uh, 2030 and onward uh, issues. And again, on the, the solar side, there are really no technology or cost issues to worry about it as well. It's, um, it's relatively low cost power, not quite as low cost as wind, but uh, relatively low cost. And I wanted to say a word about um, small and medium uh, nuclear reactors. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest ab about this in, uh, in SAS power, and it's uh, interest of also to uh, Ontario power generation and New Brunswick power. And uh, the idea is that a, a small uh, nuclear reactor uh, uh, the, is in the, in the order of 300 megawatts capacity, which is the normal increment of power that SAS power likes to have for its utilities. Uh, uh, you know, when it's expanding power, it's usually in 300, 350 megawatt type capacities. And uh, SMRs are aimed at that sort of market. And, uh, but um, SMRs are they're dispatchable power, but uh, like coal fired, fired power plants, they, they, they don't ramp up and ramp down very quickly. So, in the old speak of a power industry, an SMR would be base load and uh, you know, tend to run most of the time. Um, the Ontario power generation is, uh, 
proposing to have a prototype done, uh, basically a, a, a water cooled small nuclear reactor by about 2028. And uh, I think those of you that follow the nuclear industry and some of you might have heard uh, Ann Coxworth talk about this at some length, but uh, generally speaking, the nuclear industry is uh, almost incapable of uh, meeting a schedule and bringing something in on budget. So I'm suspecting that the uh, OPG prototype will slip into the 2030s and uh, will be very, very expensive. And the, the real message here about SMRs is that I think the power planning decisions that SAS power needs to make will have to be taken long before an, an, an operational SMR is available to a corporation. So I'm thinking that the uh, devotion to SMRs by SAS Power is probably misguided if the um, trend towards uh, being off carbon generated power by 2035 or even 2040 becomes a factor. Not sure what's... My slide isn't advancing, uh, Megan, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we're getting a weird noise there. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 un, I'll unshare and then, oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, there's something funny going on, but I'm not sure. I don't know if I, um, so I, I think we, the question then becomes, what do we do? And that's, uh, I'm going to just unshare my screen for a minute and then come back in, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah my computer seems to have locked up. Oh, she. Oh, yeah. Okay. We're good. Yeah. Uh, uh, perfect. I didn't have to do anything. No. So uh, I don't know what was going on there. But uh, so my, my question is what to do. And uh, I've divided this into risk categories. And uh, so I think the, you know, connecting to Manitoba to the extent possible, and that's at least a thousand megawatts of capacity is, uh, is low risk, cost effective, and uh, you know, makes, makes in a sense from a whole bunch of ways. Um, I think also a significant expansion of solar power in this province also makes a whole lot of sense and needs to, to move ahead very, very quickly. And uh, I should say too, just by way of solar, uh, that you'll notice how Saskatchewan and SAS Power has really moved ahead on wind power. And it's, it's just because they've gained experience and confidence in the technology and they, they need to do that same thing very quickly with solar power so that they, they feel um, uh, that they can move ahead and uh, with confidence because reliability of supply is always uppermost in a power company's thinking. And, uh, you know, they, uh, the idea of um, getting experience and moving ahead quickly is important on the solar front. I think there are probably some, uh, uh, at least a couple of opportunities for cogeneration related power. And that's, um, that's something that's low risk as well. Um, what I call medium risk is um, carbon capture and storage at gas-fired power stations. I think that's um, uh, in the timeline that uh, SAS Power is looking at, that it, it may be feasible by 2030 or thereabouts, but uh, there's a lot of development work still to be done and the uh, cost factors uh, you know, could be significant. So that's uh, what I call medium risk. And I put the SMRs down as high risk just because the, um, it's, you know, no one has made one yet. Um, OPG thinks they'll have one by 2028. I think they might have one by 2038. And uh, no matter what they do, it'll be dreadfully expensive. So I don't see um, SMRs as uh, part of the way forward. So that's where I ended up. Um, and I see the, these opinions on this slide are, are my own opinions. and. Uh, uh, SES is going to work through some of the questions about uh, gas-fired power and where to go from here. But, uh, but I'd like to conclude just with this slide. And uh, 
point out that um, you know SAS Power now is a gas fired utility. So uh, when we criticize SAS Power as being a coal fired utility, it's it's still somewhat valid, but uh, they are changing, and um, we SAS SES feels that. Uh, they need to move ahead more ambitiously. And uh, one easy way to get at that is to make sure by 2030, um, not only capacity will be 50%, but generation will be 50%. So that's a, a way to go anyway. And then the, the current mix of carbon-free electricity targets, um, SAS Power has an aspirational target of 2050, SES proposed 2040, and it looks very much as if the world is going towards 2035. So I think that's the, uh, the immediate challenge for SAS power. And I call the, the last one is just the, the gas fired power station problem. And uh, I've talked a little bit about that, but I believe that uh, the chance of uh, uh, SAS power having to put uh, gas fired power plants to sleep before their, uh, you know, their normal lifetime is very, very real. And it does in my mind, uh, drawn to question the, um, the desirability and the, the idea of uh, building more gas-fired power plants. So I think I'll close with that and uh, I'd invite any questions that people might have or comments people might have.